Hi, my name is Alan Mann. Um, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the BME department. Um, I also teach classes for the department. These are human dermal fibroblasts growing in culture. And we're taking phase contrast images to look at their morphology. So I, I didn't really understand what an engineer did on like a day-to-day -day basis until my senior year, where I did a year long of research with a professor and a grad student. I had my own independent research project. So that's very similar to what you would be doing in your co-op, where you'll go out and actually experience what engineers do on a day-to-day -day basis. Biomedical engineering is a very broad field. I chose academia, but there's lots of choices you can choose. I had choices of going to industry, or working in just general um, business. I'd say uh, biomedical engineering is obviously a very broad field. You have your range from the mechanical side and the prosthetic development all the way down to maybe the more life sciences and pharmaceuticals and drug delivery. And I'd say a biomedical engineer can cover any aspect of that, that range. What we really do is we solve very, very complex problems that require a lot of assumptions and we have to feel comfortable with them and we break them down to the simplest forms and we solve them. Um, to me, I guess, Biomedical engineers um, focus on all the technological advances that are happening today and say, hey, how can we use this to better the lives of people? Not, not just us in our first world country, but like the entire world. So how can we create a way to um, fix the future, I guess? A medical engineer combines a lot of different types of engineering into one because the body has so many different types of forces and um, components to it. So you need to be able to deal with mechanical systems and fluid systems um, and electrical systems all into one. If you had a, a biological researcher might not have the exposure to engineering concepts that would allow them to solve certain problems and vice versa, an engineer would, who could have difficulty providing solutions to somebody who uh, spoke the bio-speak, so to say. And um, if you're a biomedical engineer, you have a foot on uh, both sides of that door, and it allows you to bridge the gap, I'd say, between the two disciplines and allow both of them to work together more effectively to deliver solutions. I feel like a biomedical engineer utilizes the general engineering principles and skills to solve problems in the medical or biological industries. Biomedical engineering has a generational impact um, and I think that's what biomedical engineers do is that they change generations to come. My name is Jay Dolis. I'm a fourth year biomedical engineer. I co-opt at GuidePoint Laboratories in Gainesville, Florida. We didn't really have a specific product. We had a line of different genetic tests that we offered that I would develop that would be performed within the lab. We were looking mainly at um, diagnosing different types of cancer, such as colorectal, esophageal, and prostate cancer. We are also looking at um, determining rates of drug metabolism based on genetics. My normal day consisted of uh, research into the different um, tests that we were doing, the different genes that we were looking at and then trying to apply my research into developing a test to see what genotype an individual would have, or um, looking at microRNAs to see, and quantifying them to see whether the patient had some sort of disease. Hi, my name is Nicholas Galotti, and I'm a fourth year biomedical engineering student. Um, my first co opt in the lab with Dr. Lepisco here at RIT, and then I co opt most recently at Seawest Biosciences in North Delaware, Massachusetts. So formerly I was a tech support scientist. I worked with the tech support team at Seahorse Bioscience. Um, my primary job was to collect and catalog information from publications that contained information obtained uh, with the device made by Seahorse Biosciences. 
Hi, my name is Amanda Murray. I'm a fourth year biomedical engineering student and I did my co-op at Stryker Spine. We reported MDRs, which are called medical device reporting, and we would submit these every month to the FDA and I would work on a daily basis to um, get complaints that were filed by surgeons and patients um, through the system. In problem was really completing FDA requirements and um, if they didn't stand up to the specifications that we set, then we needed to recall the product and change the specifications or um, engineer the device differently so that it followed the specifications. My name is Dylan. I am a fourth year biomedical engineering student and I have co-opted three times. Uh, first at the lab of doc or Dr. Lepisco at the RIT the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Second at the Neural Stem Cell Institute uh, in the Rensselaer area. And thirdly at the SUNY Center for Nanoscale Science and Engineering. At the uh, Neural Stem Cell Institute, actually, I worked with uh, a team of uh, tissue researchers who were trying to develop a uh, cure for certain kinds of degenerative uh, ocular diseases, and they were actually working in a mouse model, which is they were doing research on mice, and uh, one of the big problems that they were having with their research was the difficulty in performing surgical procedures on such a small area, because the mouse eye is very small and uh, I, I ended up designing a device that helped them to hold the mouse eye in a position that allowed them to condu or conduct their research uh, more quickly and repeatedly, and also made it easier to train new technicians on their procedures. So yeah, I'd, I'd say that the, um, the overlapping knowledge between uh, the engin more engineering side of our education and also a lot of biomedical considerations like um, the anatomy of the eye, what sort of considerations you have to take into account when working with a physiological system, those were very important because it allowed me to communicate with the, uh, the tissue researchers and also to do uh, more of a mechanical design. Uh, my name is Caitlin Bussey. I'm a fifth year biomedical engineer and I've done a year's worth of co-ops now starting at the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine in North Carolina. Um, and then here at RIT in the Nano Biodevices Lab, and then finally at Janssen Pharmaceuticals in Springhouse, Pennsylvania. I'm Morgan Stussel. I'm a fifth-year biomedical engineer as well, and I have co-opted with the Women in Engineering program here at RIT, um, Janssen Pharmaceuticals in Melbourne, PA, and Ortho Clinical Diagnostics in Rochester, New York. And I worked under the Pharmaceutical Development and Manufacturing Sciences Division um, under Janssen, and uh, my main project was vaccine development and technology upscale. So I worked a lot with building bioreactors and design of experiments within those bioreactors, um, primarily with media type and composition. So the cells respond to the different components of the media and will grow differently, experience different growth profiles. So I was trying to find the best one for the media um, to create the vaccine. At Orthoclinical Diagnostics, I did feasibility testing and proof of concept for a new clinical chemistry system. So orthoclinical diagnostics does um, diagnostic medicine. So blood, urine, and cerebrospinal fluid get tested. Um, when the doctor asks you, ask, tells that you need a blood test, um, they grab your blood and then they stick it in a machine. And so orthoclinical makes those machines. And so we're working on a new clinical chemistry system. My name is Kayla Wheeler. I'm a fifth year biomedical engineer and I've co-opted at um, strain measurement devices in Connecticut and also I've co-opted um, for my startup through the business school. We basically came up with a startup idea of creating headgear to prevent against concussions, um, particularly in non-helmeted sports. We're working on the customization aspect of the headgear, um, so we're essentially creating um, padded foam that we can implement into helmets and also into headbands for non-helmeted sports. Um, and we've had our products the third party tested and basically um, they perform statistically better than what's already out there so we're really excited about that. Hi, my name is Lindsay Domblowski and I'm a fourth year biomedical engineering student. I've co-opted at Mind Safety Appliances, um, I've co-opted with Engineering World Health in Rwanda and I've co-opted at Thermal Gradient. So um, Thermal Gradient does a point of care device to detect if a patient has 
HIV or tuberculosis or other diseases using polymerase chain reactions in less than eight minutes. So the conventional method takes 45 minutes. Real engineering techniques, you really have to think, you really have to come up with your own designs, your own experiments, and use a lot of what I've learned in my classes. Uh, my name's uh, John Ray, and I'm a fourth year biomedical engineering student. I co-opted uh, Santa Fe Pasture in Swiftwater, Pennsylvania. Our problems, more or less being in the flu support lab, was to uh, test different strains of vaccine to see which, uh, if we could improve the efficiency of the vaccine made at the end of the process. So we changed small parts of the uh, whole week-long vaccine making process and see what produced the best results. Cell and molecular biology for engineers was really crucial because that provided me the skills such as DNA extraction and polymerase chain reaction, which were really the fundamentals of the tests that we were doing. Also, engineering analysis um, gave me data analysis skills, which were useful for um, just understanding the results I would get from the tests and also trying to optimize the systems. Um, I really liked uh, biocompatibility and in, in the immune system. That really piqued my interest um, for my career direction. Um, also, cell and molecular biology moved me into my first co-op. The, the fact that I knew how to work under the hood um, and had that experience was a big factor for them. Our uh, biocompatibility slash immunology class was very beneficial in terms of just understanding the concept behind a vaccine and how it works in the body and how you need to produce it. My favorite course still is probably the cellular and molecular biology. Um, in which in the lab we get introduced to cell culture and that has pretty much driven my entire co-op search and my future <laughs> in general. So I would say a lot of the lab classes really helped out um, being able to explain what projects you're working on, um, types of equipment such as like LabVIEW and SolidWorks um, I used in my co-op actually so um, those classes are really helpful. Uh, so the goal of the lab was to be able to record the actual potential of the worm and from the head to tail and then tail to head and then using that we were able to find the velocity of the actual potential and the conduction. I'd say this experiment would be relevant because if you wanted to move on to um, like studying action potentials in like a human where a prosthetic would be attached to like somebody's arm, we would want to be able to map out how action potentials um, change when you have a different stimulus in a different location. Uh, Nate is going to go ahead and look over to 3.2 and the program will measure the voltage change. Um, then he'll look back and we'll see what happens. Um, Possibly it could be used to diagnose different types of seizures, whether they're um, physiological or uh, induced. Um, Kelsey uses it to measure your reaction time to something. So if someone's like having a difficulty, uh, like picking up like a light turning color, mm -hmm. uh, possibly concussion testing or mm -hmm. something like that. actually probably after your third year so if you don't know MATLAB it uh, stacks up pretty quick. Uh, study, do your homework, I don't know. Learn physics. Learn physics. <laughs> physics is good to make sure that you actually want to be an engineer first. You want to be, make sure that your math and physics skills are strong so that you can perform as an engineer in essentially any function but specifically for biomedical applications. It's so many different things combined. So they need to be interested in the biology component, and they need to be interested in the engineering component. There's a lot of math and biology mixed together. Make sure that um, your passion is for helping others, because that's what this major is all about. Um, and I would say, even when it gets difficult, to keep reminding yourself that 
lives are going to be changed because of the education that you're getting and because of the career path that you're choosing. So it may be difficult now, but you're going to make life easier for someone coming up. Really branch out and network and make sure that you meet a lot of people and you um, kind of learn what you're interested in. Come to RIT, but if you don't want to come to RIT, find a school that has a co-op program because it's gold, like it's worth its weight in gold, literally. You will get a job so quickly. The things you learn in co-op, you can't learn in a traditional academic setting. being a biomedical engineer because I'm really good at math and the engineering aspect of this biological career path lets me apply that mathematical structure to the biological world. The thing I like most about being a bio biomedical engineer is that it's complicated and that it isn't straightforward or it isn't easy in any way. So a lot of the problems that we have to solve are variable or have a lot of variables included in them and that makes it kind of like a puzzle and assembling all the pieces of knowledge that we have from different classes is kind of how you solve that puzzle. I love being able to use engineering problem solving skills in a medical or biological application. Well, I definitely like the uh, like biological aspect of both you know, biomedical science and biomedical engineering, but I feel like the difference comes in the ability to problem solve. And I like being able to see a process or a system from start to finish and assess where an issue may be as compared to maybe just understanding an end result and only counting that as true. The broad, like, whole process design that you get to see. With, like, life sciences, you may get to see a process, like a cell culture, but you might not completely understand it. As a biomedical engineer, you have the problem-solving skills to assess a situation, realize what might be wrong with it, and you can apply that to a life system. I really like the combination of being able to design products and also help people through those solutions. And um, I liked being able to have so many applications that are out there, whether it's research or working for an engineering firm, um, designing prosthetics or medicine. You have an impact on the fundamentals of what's going on. Doctors, um, while their work is extremely important, they use what biomedical engineers make. My name is Alexandra Lalonde. Um, I'm a third year biomedical engineering student and I work in Dr. Lefisco's microscale bio separations lab. Um, our lab does like small scale particle separations um, using diophthorphoresis. Um, right now, I'm working on um, an insulator-based um, diopterphoresis project focusing on um, changing the geometries of the different insulating posts and seeing the effect it has on the particle trapping. To do diopterphoresis, um, you have to soak your um, devices in KOH overnight to recharge the channel. So typically, um, I go in in the morning and flush the devices with water um, and let it kind of like sit for an hour. And then I work on like computer stuff or different things or like analyzing data that I had from the previous day. Um, and then mostly I just run experiments for the day. Wow. So culturing right now five different bacteria strains. So I usually passage um, the bacteria while I'm waiting or as a break in between running experiments. Um, usually I run experiments most of the day and then I analyze the data at the end of the day um, and kind of summarize, I guess, what I what I did for that day and what I need to do for tomorrow. My favorite part, I guess, would be, like, I started working in um, Dr. Pisco's lab over the summer and I had no idea what dialectophoresis was when I first started um, and, like, I didn't even know what the word meant. So it was really cool for me to be able to learn um, how to do it and, I guess, like, learn a specific... Um, like concentration within like this major that I had like no idea that even existed like I was not aware really of microfluidics before I started and now I feel like comfortable enough to like walk in and set up an experiment on my own or like have a conversation with someone about which it which I think is really like rewarding to be able to do um, considering I had no idea how to do it in the first place. Yeah. Being on the paper obviously 
like your name is attached to whatever you get submitted. So um, Blanco was really good at taking kind of like step through step through the process and really showing me, I guess, like what uh, what you have to do and like how much work actually goes into like producing um, something that goes into a journal. I was mostly the person who liked the different like images and stuff that we got um, for the paper were mostly like my experiments that I set up and I too kind of like oversaw what I was doing and like checked my work to see if it was like usable and stuff. So a lot of like the data analysis I did um, and like the images themselves that went into the paper, some of them um, were from experiments that I did. The one really cool thing about being a biomedical engineer is there's a lot of different places you can go with it, whether you want to work in like a lab full time or mm -hmm. end up teaching. Um, so this has just been really a way to kind of like open my eyes to see if this is something that I'd want to do full time um, and just getting a more like well-rounded experience. So my name is Liz Doyan. I'm a third year biomedical engineering major. So I'm working in the nanobio device lab where Dr. Gaborski is the principal investigator. The core focus of the Gaborski lab is the development and the use of ultra-thin nanomembranes. One of the current applications of these membranes is cell culture and tissue engineering. Um, so we're currently investigating the role of the membrane porosity and the permeability and its influence on cell growth and differentiation. And the membranes provide a more physiologically relevant support substrate, meaning they more closely mimic the human body compared to conventional materials. We use these membrane properties to help investigate stem cell differentiation with the goal of creating artificial blood vessels for engineered tissues. Right now I'm working on patterning endothelial cells into tubes using um, like polymers or PDMS, stuff that's non-stick to the cells, and then patterning them into like pre-blood vessel type stuff. Um, I usually come in, um, sit down, figure out what I need to do for that day. If I'm going to do an experiment that day, I need to um, write it all down in my notebook, like plan out everything before I get started, like amounts that I'm going to need, mm -hmm. everything like that. I just make sure I have it really well planned out. Um, and then go into the lab, um, depends I guess on the day, but just get everything set up, um, any reagents that I'm going to need, um, if I'm working with like bonding, like bond some PDMS to like a cover slip, stuff like that, get everything set up, work on the experiment. Um, and then usually just like imaging throughout the day, keeping up on it. If I need to use cells, I like passage them once everything's set up and then look at them throughout the day, check the progress, um, usually make a note on like Evernote we use to keep everything organized, um, like saying the progress of the experiment. And then, I don't know, sometimes we read papers, like in our downtime, read like research papers um, from other labs like around the world just to like keep up on stuff. So I first got involved in research just to do something outside of classes to get some more knowledge in the field. Mostly just kind of to get some experience under my belt before I moved to something that was more like company related. But my experience in doing research had really changed my views as far as what I want to do with my career. I first was interested in prosthetics and stuff like that, very much more mechanical type stuff, but then um, with the research I'm doing now, it's more like tissue engineering type stuff, and I'm really interested in that now, so it's kind of changed my direction. Uh, my name is Babak Mohgani. I am a fifth year electrical engineering student um, doing the BSMS program. I'm working in the biomedical signal and image analysis lab. Our lab takes in signal data from the human body. Mainly we're working with heart data, so like ECG recording. The normal heartbeat is you have small uh, P wave, then a QRS complex, and then a T wave. For atrial fibrillation, instead of one you know pump of the right atrium, it starts pumping a little bit more rapidly. And so what you see in a patient's ECG is you have a P wave, but then there's also a few other smaller waves before the QRS complex occurs. So we're just trying to see where we can put these leads and easily detect that a patient has atrial fibrillation. Usually just, you know, come into the lab, uh, sit on the computer, open up MATLAB, start looking at the signals. Uh, currently when we have that GE Holter recording device, I began working with that, so that was a little bit more hands-on, but mostly it's just analyzing signals in MATLAB. 
GE has that diagram on there, and these precordial leads are standard V1 through V6, as was shown with me hooking that up. The other four, they go two on the collarbone and two on the bottom of the rib cage. Uh, the reason those are there is because the device that we purchased from GE, that is a portable device, and for a, a patient to have that on for a day or two days in a row would be problematic if you actually had the leads on the wrists as well as the arms. We have data from a hospital in the UK. We only have 20 patients so far, so it's 10 atrial fibrillation and 10 sinus rhythm patients. We have one minute ECG recordings of each of the leads, maybe on that 64 lead diagram. What we're doing is running that through a filter that we generated in MATLAB, and the filter we generate is based on papers we've read that remove baseline wander as well as reduce the noise of the signal. And after we've run it through a filter, we start analyzing it, and we're specifically doing entropy analysis on them to see if patients who have atrial fibrillation have a higher entropy than patients who have normal heart beating. When I was born, I had um, some heart problems. So when I was two years old, I had my first open heart surgery. And then at nine years old, I had another heart surgery. So ever since growing up being in and out of the hospital, I've just gotten used to, and I've been very interested in like the technology behind biomedical instrumentation. So when I applied to RIT, in the, they didn't have a biomedical engineering program at the time, but they had electrical engineering with a biomed option. And ever since I've been taking like bio classes like anatomy and physiology along with signal processing courses, I just became interested in that. And I heard Dr. Gorani was doing research specifically using signal processing for like heart defects. And I was interested in that. So I came and talked to her and here I am. The research is just that, you know, I want to help people like myself. Maybe they can discover these problems sooner and they can correct them before it leads to more problems in life for them. Our program is housed on the third floor of Institute Hall, where you'll find our two main teaching labs, also referred to as the wet and dry lab, that have been designed to support a variety of different laboratory experiments. We also have six 750 square foot faculty research labs, a high-end computing research lab, as well as space for student projects. We also have additional space found on our A level and on the fourth floor. This is a laboratory experiment for the introduction to biomedical engineering course. In this uh, particular laboratory experiment, the students are being exposed to three different concepts. The first concept is going to be microfluidics. The second concept is flow regimes, and the third one is mass transfer by diffusion. Microfluidics is a rapidly growing field, it's a still a new field, and it refers to the application of a small micro devices to perform analysis. It has important advantages over normal system because when we use a microfluidic device, we can get results in a matter of minutes. So this is something that is going to become more important in the future. A lot of the normal analysis that we do nowadays in the future are going to be performed in microfluidic devices. Another important advantage that they have is that they require a very little sample. That is important, especially for biomedical engineering samples, when sometimes the sample that we have is very scarce. Uh, one example given to the student is, imagine that we have to do the blood analysis in a premature baby. The amount of blood available, it is very little. So if we are able to perform those analysis with a tiny sample, it's a much better option. The second concept that was introduced to the student was flow regimes. We talked during this laboratory experiment that we have laminar flow and turbulent flow. It was important for the student to get to know this subject because later on they're going to take a class on fluid mechanics called continuum mechanics. The third concept that was introduced in this laboratory experiment was mass transfer by diffusion. In particular, we used two different dyes. Those dyes were introduced in a small micro channel that the students created employing gelatin. In this micro channel that had the shape of a Y, the student had two inlet pores. 
so they could see how the dye will mix slowly inside the channel. By observing the interface between the two dyes, the students were able to see the power of the fusion. So one exciting class of biomaterials are hydrogels. Hydrogels are networks of either synthetic or natural polymers that absorb and swell with water. These materials have a variety of applications, but there's two very exciting ones within biomedical engineering. One is tissue engineering. These networks of polymers help provide scaffolds for cells to grow on and in vitro tissues and organ constructs. They also allow passageways for nutrients and small molecules to diffuse to and from the cells. Additionally, hydrogels are often used in controlled release drug capsules. For example, drugs that are taken orally are designed to typically dissolve and release the drug inside either the mouth or the stomach or the digestive tract. The properties of the hydrogel can be optimized for a time release, and this can be based upon pH, salt concentration, or another physiological parameter. In the Intro to BME course, one of the laboratories the students complete is a hydrogel lab. The students explore the swelling properties of hydrogels as a function of salt concentration. While hydrogels, as we just discussed, are used in tissue engineering and drug release, they're also used in a lot of common consumer products, including shampoos and the foods we eat, but also diapers. So in this laboratory, we use infant diapers which are loaded with a highly absorbent hydrogel called polyacrylic acid. The students investigate absorbency of the diapers in solutions with varying salt concentrations, which is also referred to as osmolarity. The solutions we use range from deionized water with no salt to a buffer that mimics blood plasma all the way up to a buffer that's equivalent to concentrated urine. The students find there's a strong nonlinear relationship between how much solution the diaper will hold and the osmolarity of that solution. In musculoskeletal biomechanics, students learn the basics of statics and mechanics and their application to the musculoskeletal system. In the first laboratory in this class, students create models of the knee and the elbow joint. They investigate the significance of the insertion point, its angle, and how that affects force generation. From this laboratory, students then explore muscle force generation in the actual human body. They're asked to investigate antagonistic pairs using electromyography or EMG measurements. EMG is the measurement of the electrical potential of activated muscle cells. Students choose which antagonistic pairs they wish to study. Then they must choose the range of motion that would demonstrate that the muscles have opposing behavior. In the third year of the program, we have a two-core sequence systems physiology one and systems physiology two that really serve to look at human physiology from both a quantitative and a systems point of view. And it's important that the students actually get to experience uh, that level of system integration by going ahead and making measurements uh, for example, here we're going ahead and uh, instrumenting the students to measure electrical activity in the cerebral cortex uh, using a device um, that allows us to measure the EEG or electroencephalogram. And the students uh, hopefully have valid brain waves, and we uh, extract those brain waves and actually allow the students to make quantitative assessments relative to uh, their state of consciousness, if you will. Um, so live uh, information and taking that information and uh, making quantitative measurements. And as you can see, it's a very interactive uh, and very pleasant experience. The other uh, aspect of uh, system physiology is the fact that we're taking the data and analyzing it uh, very carefully uh, and it's important for the students to recognize that there's a great deal of variability here we're actually measuring pulmonary uh, capabilities again using the students to provide the data and uh, providing quantitative assessment of their behavior and looking at the variation across the, a population of students. Hello, my name is Sebastian Vega. 
I am a fifth year graduate student in chemical engineering and biomedical engineering at Rutgers University. So one piece of advice that I would give is um, don't take your classes for granted. If you would like to continue your education, um, do so and uh, don't let a paycheck or something like that get in the way of that. Okay, so my name is Cheryl Gamillion. I'm originally from South Carolina and my doctoral work was completed at Clemson University. I also did my undergraduate studies there as well, so I kind of was in the same institution for a while in bioengineering. So if I had to suggest one thing, it would be to find something that you can be passionate about um, because you spend a lot of time, and if this is your career choice, like you will spend a lot of time, countless hours, like it doesn't just stay at work when you leave, you take this work home with you. So you have to really enjoy what it is that you're doing. Hi, I'm Tom Gramlich. I graduated from RIT in 1971 and I went to the cooperative training program in mechanical engineering and with Xerox, which was very good. I think the most important thing is persistence. And biomedical engineering is important, as any engineering curriculum is. It's going to be difficult to get through the process, but I can tell you that I persisted. And it took a little more than five years, five and a half, but I made it to the end, and that's what's really important. So as an engineer, although I have the electrical background, you're working closely with all the other engineering disciplines, the mechanical engineers, the software engineers, all the different engineers. There are a lot of times when I'm given a project, given a problem that I have to solve that includes other com types of engineering components. As an engineer, you're trained to solve problems and you may have a background in one specific discipline, but that does not mean you're stuck in that discipline. Another important thing besides persistence is taking some pride in your work and really feeling as if it was your project, your company, your problem, and what can you do to solve that. And so the extra mile that you go to do it yourself or find someone to work with your boss or the colleagues to really get to the bottom of something and make a real significant improvement or a contribution is how you will stand out and become successful.